the Lord be with you. Welcome to our uh, online talk again this week from St John's in Highbridge. Hope you're very well. We had a bit of sad news um, this week in church in that we have lost, um, sadly, one of our uh, most long-standing members, um, whose name was Jeff, and uh, he was 93, and he died just last week. And we've lost a few people in the life of the church recently, um, a lady called Gaynor and a lady called Pat as well. So we're feeling, feeling the loss of these folk a little bit. And um, we are praying for them and for their loved ones. So that puts a bit of context into some of the things that I'll be saying in my talk this week, um, which is for the Feast of the Presentation. So this is the story of uh, Jesus coming into the temple um, as an infant with Mary and Joseph. So let's begin in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, light of the nations and glory of Israel, make your home among us and present us pure and holy to your heavenly Father, your God and our God. Amen. So the readings for the Feast of the Presentation uh, we have Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 40, and also Psalm 24. The start of this week probably saw half of Britain outside on frosty mornings de-icing and scraping their cars. I've been out there too, scraping away, because although we have one of those windscreen covers, um, I always seem to forget to put it on. But there are some days when neither my wife nor I have to drive anywhere, and so it doesn't particularly matter on those days. But what I've noticed is that on those days the sun does the job for me. As the sun rises, a little transparent patch appears on the windscreen and it slowly works its way across until by early afternoon sort of time, the screen is completely clear. Patience is a virtue. Now, as I was observing this uh, one day this week, it seemed to me that it could serve as a pretty good metaphor for faith on this, the Feast of the Presentation. Sometimes in our lives of faith, we experience a crisis or a moment of great insight. In those experiences, God can dramatically clear our vision, a bit like the scraping of the windscreen. At other times, however, Faith is not like that. It's more like the gradual work of the winter sun. It's a long, slow transformation. Both experiences, both the sudden and the gradual, bring clarity. Both are part of what it means to be a Christian. Today's Gospel reading introduces us to two figures who understood about this. They are older people. They are prayerful people. They're probably like some of the people watching this video. And they're called Anna and Simeon. Now Simeon, despite being, uh, we read, a devout and holy man, didn't hang out in the Jerusalem temple all the time. Uh, St Luke tells us that um, Simeon was specifically led there one particular day by the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit whom he says rested on him. Simeon is neither prophet nor priest, but he has a part to play in God's unfolding drama. Anna, who's the other person in the tale, came to the temple because we read that's what she did every day. Anna does have, uh, as it were, a named role. She's described as a prophet, and she stands in a long line, actually, of female prophets, who brought God's truth to Israel. Her vocation was prayer and fasting. And no doubt, she also encouraged the faith of visitors who pitched up at the temple. Now, in one sense, Anna and Simeon represent what it feels like to be present at a dramatic moment. It's a bit like when Queen Elizabeth visited Highbridge in 1958. There's some footage of it on YouTube if you want to see it. 
So the coming of Christ into the temple then, even as an infant, is a momentous occasion. It's a a royal arrival. It's an epiphany moment in every sense of the word. As Psalm 24 puts it, the king of glory has come in. But you know, in another sense, Simeon and Anna represent for us something far less dramatic and much more gradual. They represent life's faithful plod. And it is just that at times, isn't it, life? Now, these two faithful elderly people are emblematic of Israel's long wait for a Messiah, for a ruler who would liberate them from their sense of exile. They have been waiting a long time. So I wonder what Simeon and Anna thought when they saw Mary and Joseph. This young couple, shuffling nervously into the temple, no doubt a bit overwhelmed by it all. I wonder if they knew anything about them. Well, they would have seen that Mary and Joseph were poor. The law stated that um, one lamb and one dove should be brought for this ritual of dedication. But if you couldn't afford that, then two doves would just about do. So Mary and Joseph, we read, were clearly in this category. They were poor. I wonder too if any rumours had circulated about them. The fact that Mary had fallen pregnant before she was married. News like that travels fast. Had it reached Jerusalem, I wonder. And they were from Nazareth, which was not a place that you'd be particularly proud to call home. It was a bit of a backwater in those days. Now it's probably pushing things a bit to say that the Holy Family were undesirables. But when they arrived at the temple, they weren't exactly the mayor and corporation. Put it that way. Now, Simeon and Anna, if they're aware of any of this, they don't let on. On the contrary, in fact, they recognise that in this little family, there is the very presence of God. Not just God in some abstract sense, but the divine human saviour they've been waiting for for decades. They declare, don't they, that they've seen nothing less than God's salvation. Now, they see this in the Holy Family, not just because they happen to be in the right place at the right time, They see God's salvation because their vision is clear. If you like, the warmth of God's love has been at work in their hearts for so long that when their epiphany moment comes, they are ready. So then, this makes me wonder. Makes me wonder how far are we at St John's in Highbridge looking for God's salvation in our midst. It depends, I guess, if our vision is sufficiently clear and also, I suppose, what we are looking for. Extended periods of waiting and expectation can lead to clarity and hope. Equally, they can dull our senses too. And if we expect to see God's salvation in people who look and think and talk exactly like we do, we may well be disappointed. If a frosty film of prejudice remains over our vision, we may miss out on what God is doing in our day. Last Saturday at Blues in the Pews, which is the live music event that we put on once a month here at St John's, um, Last Saturday, a whole lot of people came into the church who I'd never seen before. A band of 16-year-olds turned up and and performed, and they were great. A young man with special needs um, came along with his carer, and he stood on the stage, and with a bit of support, he led everybody in song. It was wonderful. And you know, the song that he sang 
uh, just happened to be, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Which was, weirdly enough, a song that I'd um, referenced in the sermon I wrote for the following Sunday. Another uh, singer, a young woman this time, um, after she had sung, she commented, you know, this isn't like other open mic nights. There's something different here, she said. Many people have said uh, similar things about Blues in the Pews. Now, we don't consciously design these nights to reflect the kingdom of God, but sometimes they just do. We notice it, I suppose, when we are already looking for God's salvation in our midst. When we are expectant and inclusive and we celebrate everyone. Now, if we can do this in a live music event, then how much more can we do this in our worship and in our everyday lives? In a public worship service, you never know who is going to walk through the door. But I have a little trick that I try really hard to employ. Whoever walks through our door over there in the church, I try to see them as a person made in the image of God. Not as a poor person, or a strange person, or a loud person, or an invisible person, but a person who bears God's image and carries that image into our midst. The book of Hebrews teaches that if we do this, we may well be entertaining angels unawares. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says that when we welcome the least And the last of this world, we welcome him. What difference would it make to you if the next person to walk in the door at church was Jesus Christ himself? Because in a a spiritual sense, but in a very real sense as well, um, they are him. They are Jesus to us. That ought to make a huge difference to us and the way we live, don't you think? But this kind of perception doesn't come naturally, not to me anyway. I tend to look with judgment. I tend to lump people into categories and lump them into stereotypes. But what the example, I think, of Anna and Simeon shows us is that the salvation of God may come in unusually humble packages. We will see Christ if we are expecting to see him. But only, I think, if we are open-minded about the form of his coming. If the warm breath of God's Spirit has melted the frostiness in our hearts, then we will see him. Now, I'm enormously encouraged uh, at St John's that there are some real Simeons and Annas among us. I won't embarrass them by naming them. But there are those who've come to church faithfully, who, who've listened to the promptings of the Spirit and who have their eyes open for the presence of God among us. Some of our Simeons and Annas are those who can no longer attend church physically anymore and uh, who may well be watching um, this video. But I know that you bless us with your prayers and with your support. Now, sometimes, of course, our Simeons and our Annas leave us for glory. And we've very sadly, as I said earlier on, lost several recently. Pat, Gaynor, and now Jeff as well. But I believe these folk are present with us still, as we are present now. Um, Worshipping with us, praying with us. And perhaps they're also in some mysterious way challenging us too, to keep our eyes open and our minds clear. So I want to honour our Simeons and our Annas uh, today and I want to thank them for their love and their faith. Perhaps you are one of them. Perhaps you aspire to be one of them. Well that's not a bad aspiration at all. 
The church's season of epiphany began with the visit of the Magi to the manger. And it ends today in the visit of our Lord Jesus to his temple. It's a season like the frosts of this week of crisp wonder and sparkling delight. It's a season when we invite God to melt our cold hearts and to open our eyes to his presence. Like Anna, like Simeon, we experience moments of sudden revelation which rest sometimes on decades of patient waiting. So much of our faith, isn't it, is like an iceberg um, below the surface and unseen. But as we seek God's presence in the manger or in the temple, in the church or in the street, we find ourselves being changed. Changed into the likeness of him whom we see. We know that Christ welcomed all who came to him with faith. Can we do any less? May this year be a year in which our hearts are expectant, our welcome is warm and our vision clear. And who knows who God might bring into our midst. Bless you this week. Amen.